Well, good morning. We invite you to take out your message notes this morning from inside your bulletin. And if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in the Old Testament in 2 Chronicles chapter 18 today. Old Testament, 2 Chronicles chapter 18. This morning we are kicking off a new three-week series called Connected. That's going to take about four weeks to get through it because next week we have a special guest who's going to be sharing with us, Pastor Yoel, uh, who is a pastor in Cuba who was connected to our mission trip that we recently were a part of, is going to be here. Uh, He'll be here for a joint community group time for the adults and the youth on Sunday morning. We'll be right here in the worship center, and then he'll be preaching uh, after that in the morning worship service. It's going to be a special day, a special service, and it's one of those things you won't want to miss. I can, I can promise you that. So come and be a part of that. Now, uh, I wonder what comes to your mind when you hear the word connected today. What does that mean to you today? Does the word connected make you think maybe of this? It's what I think of a lot when it comes to connected. How about, how about maybe this? Oh, that's sweet. Maybe something more like this. One of those ways to get connected to people. Does anybody know what this is? Instagram. No, this is not Instagram. This is, it's a phone. It's a smartphone. That's exactly right. To be specific, it's an iPhone 15 Pro Max. And and let me tell you, this device, if if you're not aware, it's a huge part of my life, okay? To be honest with you, it's almost always within arm's reach. Now, anytime I pick this up and put it down during a message, I'm pretty much guaranteed to get a text from Brian Williams. So put your phone down, Brian Williams. Don't text me or call me. That thing is almost always within arm's reach of me, and and it's always there where I need it. It keeps me connected to my family, obviously. It it keeps me connected to you as a church. It's where a lot of times I get my news and my weather and my music and, and a lot of my entertainment. I rely on it for my calendar and my contacts and, and pretty much every photo that I take. I think it's safe to say that I spend a lot of time connected to this device. And as a, as a result, it's a, it has this huge influence on me and on my life. Chances are the same is true for you. As of June 2024, there are about 310 million smartphone users in the United States. That's 96% of Americans who own a smartphone just like this one. Another study shows that American adults spend an average of 11 hours a day connected to some form of electronic media just like that. And for teens, that number jumps to nearly 13 hours a day. Now, I want you to think about that for a second. The average American sleeps around six hours a day, works around eight hours a day, but is connected for more than 11 hours a day. To be connected means to be plugged in, to be constantly receiving information and stimulation And what we're connected to carries enormous influence over us and how we live our lives. In fact, that's the first big idea that I want to explore as we kick off this series. And I would encourage you to write this down. Here's our number one truth. What we connect to and who we surround ourselves with shape how we live our lives. Let me say that again. What we connect to and who we surround ourselves with shape how we live our lives. And here's the thing. There's a positive side to this. When we're connected to the right things, healthy things, helpful things, it benefits us and those around us. But there is also a downside. When we disconnect from what's beneficial and we reconnect with unhealthy things, it can have some serious consequences for our lives. Now, we've all been there, right? We've all connected with advice or voices that we wish we had ignored later on. And on the flip side, there have been moments when we tuned out the very wisdom that we desperately needed, and we're still feeling the consequences of that in our lives. 
This tension is especially real when it comes to the battle between what our culture pushes and what God desires for us to do. I'm telling you, the choices we make about who or what we connect to can bring blessing or trouble into our lives. Over the next few weeks, we're going to dive deep into this idea of who and what we engage with, who we're connected to, and how that shapes us. Because what we connect to and who we surround ourselves with shape how we live our lives. Now, we're going to begin all of that with 2 Chronicles chapter 18. I, I, know, I don't know if you're familiar with the story, but you might be familiar with some of its characters. Let me kind of set the scene. It's around 930 B.C., the nation of Israel, you've heard me talk about this a lot, at this point is split into two kingdoms, right? The northern kingdom kept the name Israel. The southern kingdom became Judah. The northern kingdom had a wicked king named Ahab who was married to an even more notorious woman. Anybody know who it was? Jezebel, all right? The southern kingdom was actually ruled by a king named Jehoshaphat, which let's be honest, it's just a fun name to say, right? Jehoshaphat, come on. And, and right at the very beginning of this story, we learn something very critical. Ahab, bad guy, Jehoshaphat, pretty good guy, they formed an alliance. And here's what I want you to catch. When you form an alliance with someone, and it really doesn't matter who, whether it's joining a fraternity or entering into a business partnership or joining a team or getting into a dating relationship, when you form an alliance with someone, something significant happens. When you form an alliance or a connection with someone, they gain influence over your life. They gain influence for good or for bad over your life. Now, what's interesting is we don't usually think that that is going to be the case. Why? Because we like to believe that we are independent, right? We are fully in control, and we are making our own decisions. Back me up here. This is, this is how we approach things. This is how we feel. But the truth is, whenever you align yourself with someone, whether you realize it or not, you're giving them a voice into your life. And that is exactly what we see happening in this story. Let's pick up in 2 Chronicles 18, starting in verse 1, it says this. Jehoshaphat enjoyed great riches and high esteem. So he'd been blessed, and he made an alliance with Ahab of Israel by having his son marry Ahab's daughter. Very common in that day. Verse 2, a few years later, he went to Samaria to visit Ahab, who prepared a great banquet for him and his officials. They butchered great numbers of sheep, goats, and cattle for the feast. Then Ahab enticed Jehoshaphat to join forces with him to attack Ramoth Gilead. So here's the setup. Ramoth Gilead was a small but sort of strategically important town on the border between Israel and Judah. Ahab saw it as a way to, to expand his influence. But he didn't want to go into battle alone. He needed Jehoshaphat on his side. Verse 3, will you go with me to Ramoth Gilead, King Ahab of Israel, asked King Jehoshaphat of Judah. Jehoshaphat replied, why, of course, you and I are as one. And my troops are your troops. We will certainly join you in battle. Now, that sounds like he's fully on board, right? But then Jehoshaphat throws Ahab a bit of a curveball. Verse 4. Then Jehoshaphat added, but first, let's find out what the Lord says. That's basically Jehoshaphat asking, have you prayed about this? Right? Now, let's be honest. Have you prayed about this? Have you ever been asked that question? It's kind of irritating, isn't it? Right? When you already know what you want, when you already feel pretty good about what God's going to do about it, it's a little irritating. Ha haven't you ever had just the desire to say to somebody when they ask you that question? No, I haven't prayed about it. As a matter of fact, I don't plan on praying about it. Wh when I want God's opinion, I'll let him know, okay? Don't ask me that question. Because see, the reality is, and I don't know if this is true for you, but this is something I've experienced. I think many of us grew up in environments where there was a clear divide between church life and real life. Uh, do you know what I'm talking about? Some of you are probably living in that right now. Over here, 
is, you know, your spiritual side where you pray about things. And, and then over there was your everyday life where God didn't really factor into your decisions. And I'm not talking about being a good person or a bad person or a church. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about sort of compartmentalization of your spiritual life from what we think of as our real life. But for Israel, you need to understand there was to be no such division. Okay, this, these were God's nation. They're, they had to consider the spiritual implication of everything. Economics, markets, military decisions. So it was not unusual for a king like Jehoshaphat to say, before we rush into battle to take something that isn't ours, maybe we should check in with God first. Verse five, so the king of Israel, Ahab, summoned the prophets, 400 of them, 400 of them. Now, it may seem kind of impressive at first to have 400 prophets there on the standby, ready to help you know God's will. But there are a couple of things you need to know about these 400 prophets. First of all, they were pagan prophets, okay? They worshiped a pagan god named Baal, so probably not a great influence on Ahab. Second, these prophets are eventually going to show up in another famous story about a battle on Mount Carmel with the prophet of God named Elijah. And I don't want to spoil it for you, but let's just say it doesn't end well for the 400 prophets of Baal, okay? They've been painting pictures and writing songs about it ever since. So they were prophets, if not exactly the kind of prophets you would hope for, but most importantly, they were also on a king's payroll. Are you with me here? They are beholden to him. Verse five, Ahab asked them, 400 prophets, should we go to war against Ramoth Gilead or should I hold back? And the prophets, all 400 of them replied, yes, go right ahead. God will give the king victory. Ahab's like, there you go. We've heard from the Lord. Shine up your armor, boys. Well, you don't have to be a Bible expert to figure out what's going on here, do you? So Jehoshaphat's like, wait, wait, wait. Time out, this... That felt kind of quick. Like, it's almost like they knew the answer before we even asked the question. Verse six, but Jehoshaphat asked, is there not also a prophet of the Lord here? We should ask him the same question. In other words, isn't there somebody who's not on the payroll that might be a little more, shall we say, objective about this? I love this, verse seven. The king of Israel replied to Jehoshaphat, well, there is one more man we could consult the Lord for us, but I hate him. <laughs> that always cracks me up. <laughs> Ahab's like, yeah, there's one guy, but I don't like him. He never prophesies anything but trouble for me. You got that guy in your office? You know what I'm talking about? His name is Micaiah, son of Imla. I think this is kind of like when somebody asks, did you talk to your dad about this? And you're thinking, of course not. I already know what he's going to say, right? I'm not going to ask him. The truth is we often look for people around us who will go along with our plan, don't we? Come on now. Come on now. We look for people that we're pretty sure are going to back us up. We're not really usually that interested in connecting with or getting input from people who might tell us something we don't want to hear. And we can already see this attitude in Ahab's story and Let's be honest, it's true for all of us. We all have situations where we say, I want to do the right thing. But there are certain people who we avoid seeking advice from because we know exactly what they're going to say and it's not what we want to hear. And as foolish as Ahab seems right here, right now, the reality is we can look just as foolish to our Heavenly Father and to the people around us who know us and care about us. Verse eight. So Ahab, king of Israel, called one of his officials and said, quick, bring Micaiah, son of Imla. And so essentially they, they send off for the guy who's the, loin, the lone voice of reason or wisdom. And while they send for him, all the 400 prophets start a pep rally. I'm not kidding. They're dancing around. They're chanting about how bad the armies of Judah and Israel are going to destroy the Arameans. And then meanwhile, skip down to verse 12. The messenger who went to get Micaiah said to him, look, all the prophets are promising victory for the king 
be sure that you agree with them and promise success. Come on. Here's what happens. They tell him, listen, dude, this is a pep rally, okay? We got all this momentum going. Everybody's pumped up. Our team's going to go out there and crush it. So you go in there and you tell the king exactly what he wants to hear. Have you ever been in a meeting like that? And you're thinking, this is a bad idea. But everybody around you is like, no, no, no. We can do it. We can do it. Let's go get it. And we read this ancient story, and from the outside looking in, we're thinking, this is ridiculous. Why would, would, would Micaiah change what he says just to match what somebody else wants to hear, especially when he has crucial information that could impact the outcome of the nations of God? But here's the thing. Some of us are doing that very thing in our lives right now, aren't we? Maybe you're dating somebody, and all your friends are like, oh, he's so cute. Oh, she's so hot. Did you see what he drives? You got your personal cheerleading squad of 400 people chanting, date him, marry her, date her, marry her. It's just ringing in your ears. But there's that one person you haven't mentioned it to yet. You're avoiding them, aren't you? Have you thought about why you're doing that? Because you know they're the kind of person who might ask a really inconvenient spiritual question. So you just kind of keep your distance, out of sight, out of mind, because you're filtering out the noise, the common sense, the voice of wisdom, maybe even the voice of God. Verse 13, but Micaiah replied, as surely as the Lord lives, I will say only what my God says. And when Micaiah arrived before the king, Ahab asked him, Micaiah, should we go to war against Ramoth Gilead or should I hold back? And Micaiah replied sarcastically, underline that, yes, Go up and be victorious, for you will have victory over them. Now, as one for whom sarcasm is a spiritual gift, <laughs> I always appreciate a smart aleck. Yes? Ahab, however, did not seem to appreciate this. He didn't think it was funny. Verse 15, but the king replied sharply, I love this, how many times must I demand that you speak only the truth to me when you speak for the Lord? It cracks me up every time. They've apparently done this dance before, haven't they? You can tell. And then Micaiah told him in a vision, here, you want the truth? I'll give you the truth. He says, in a vision, I saw Israel, all of it scattered on the mountains like sheep without a shepherd, and the Lord said, their master has been killed. Send them home in peace. In other words, your army is going to scatter and your king is going to be killed. So then listen to what Ahab says next, verse 17. Didn't I tell you, the king of Israel exclaimed to Jehoshaphat, he never prophesies anything but trouble for me. <laughs> what did I tell you? We got the 400 cheerleaders in here. We got momentum in the room. Then you bring this guy in here, and he just rains on my parade. So what does Ahab decide to do? Well, if you're reading along, skip down to verse 25. Arrest him, the king of Israel ordered. Put this man in prison and feed him nothing but bread and water until I return safely from battle. But Micaiah replied, if you return safely, it will mean that the Lord has not spoken through me. Then he added to those standing around, everyone mark my words. <laughs> everyone mark my words. Now again, we, we kind of laugh a little bit. We're looking in on this story it doesn't really matter how old you are. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter how much time you've spent in church or not. It's kind of like watching a movie, right? You can, you can see what's coming a mile away. Because here's something we already know. Here's truth number three. The voice of the crowd is rarely the one you should follow. The voice of the crowd 
And of course there are exceptions, but it's rarely the one you should follow. And I think we know this instinctively. We know that the people who stand to gain something by telling the king what he wants to hear are not the people that the king should be listening to, yes? We know that the voice of wisdom has been silenced, locked away, and completely ignored. We know that the king has already made up his mind and he's going to do whatever he wants no matter how irrational it is because he has disconnected from godly wisdom. And without even hearing the end of the story, we can pretty much predict how it's going to turn out, can't we? It's, it's so obvious what's about to take place. But here's the thing. I don't think our stories are any less obvious. I think that if we dropped into one another's lives, we'd see the decisions that we're on the verge of making, the voices that we're choosing to ignore, and the voices that we've chosen to follow. And we'd be able to say, hey, listen, you're about to make a really bad decision here. I think it would be that clear to all of us. What do you say we finish the story anyway? Verse 28. So King Ahab of Israel and King Jehoshaphat of Judah led their armies against Ramoth Gilead. And then something really strange happens. This is where Jehoshaphat starts to realize he may have hitched his wagon to the wrong horse. Okay? Verse 29. The king of Israel, that's Ahab, said to Jehoshaphat, Here's an idea. As we go into battle, I will disguise myself so no one will recognize me. But you wear your royal robes. And so Ahab disguised himself, and they went into battle. Say, what? I mean, please tell me that you're kidding. But Ahab wasn't kidding. He was dead serious. And Jehoshaphat's got to be thinking, wait a second, what about the 400 cheerleaders? What about all that courage? What about all that momentum back there that we had? Now you're not even willing to step up and be the king in front of your own troops? Well, here's why this is important. Because the same thing that was going on inside of Ahab, I think, is the same thing that's going on inside of us so much of the time. Even though Ahab had been very convincing on the outside, even though he'd rallied all the people on the payroll, even though he had convinced Jehoshaphat, even though he had silenced the voice of truth, I think in his heart, the words of, of Micaiah still rang true. Now, come on. Isn't it true you can argue your wife into submission? You can argue your parents into throwing up their hands and saying, okay, we give up. But in your heart, there's a doubt. And a lot of times that doubt is linked to one person or maybe those two people who have got nothing to gain by telling you what you wanted to hear. And so they instead tell you exactly what you needed to hear. And you know that they told you the truth. You just don't want to listen. Verse 30. Meanwhile, the king of Aram had issued these orders to his chariot commanders. Attack only Ahab, king of Israel. Don't bother with anyone else. That's interesting. So when the Aramean chariot Commanders saw Jehoshaphat in his royal robes. They went after him. There is the king of Israel, they shouted. But Jehoshaphat called out, and the Lord saved him. God helped him by turning the attackers away from him. As soon as the chariot commanders realized Jehoshaphat was not the king of Israel, they stopped chasing him. So fortunately for Jehoshaphat, God bailed him out. But do you see that this godly king nearly lost his life because he put himself in an alliance with Ahab, with somebody who did not have his best interest at heart. Do you see that? Oh, but the story's not quite over. Verse 33. An Aramean soldier, however, randomly shot an arrow at the Israelite troops and hit Ahab, king of Israel, between the joints of his armor. Turn the horses... And get me out of here, Ahab groaned to the driver of the chariot. I'm badly wounded. The battle raged all that day, and the king of Israel propped himself up in his chariot facing the Arameans. And then in the evening, just as the sun was setting, he died. 
He died. Ahab died. Now, can I point something out to you? I want you to really hear me on this. He didn't have to. Die, that is. Am I right or am I wrong? Do you see that Ahab lost his life because he wouldn't listen to the right voice? Now, we've all seen people who lost their marriages because they didn't tune in to the right voices. We've all known people who lost their financial security because they followed culture rather than the voice of truth. They did what everybody else was doing, ignoring the wisdom that they needed to hear. And let's not forget teenagers who've lost their freedom, their clear conscience, and their way because they ignored the lone voice of wisdom in favor of the crowd saying, it's fine, it's no big deal, everybody's doing it, you'll love it. None of us have to look far to find somebody, or maybe it's even us, who've made poor decisions because of this crucial truth. What we connect to and who we surround ourselves with shape how we live our lives. Okay? So this morning, we're going to end a little bit differently. We're going to end by me asking you four questions to help you evaluate who and what you're connected to. And we're going to take a little time with this. I, I want you to really think through it. I want you to put some serious thought into it and really consider what your responses need to be. I'm going to ask Jamie and our praise team, you guys can come on. And, and while they're coming, I want to work through these four questions and I want you to really think about it. I don't know if you have the courage to take a pen or a pencil and to write down names, write some things down. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. But let me challenge you to, to really take this seriously. Here's question number one. Are you ready? Who in your life has your attention right now? Who in your life has your ear? Whose advice do you lean into in your life? Can you identify that person right now? Take a moment and do that. There's probably more than one, right? If you're not writing them down, can you at least picture them in your mind? Okay. Question number two. Who should you stop paying attention to? Who should you stop paying attention to in your life? Who do the people who have proven their love for you over time wish you'd quit listening to? Who does your spouse wish you'd stop paying attention to? Who do your parents hope that you'd stop following? Can you picture those people in your minds? Number three, who should you be listening to instead? If you're new to church or you're just returning, you know, this is a, a good moment to consider the, influ the importance of godly influence in your life. Where are you going to find the voice of truth in this world? How can you build relationships with people who truly care about your spiritual well-being? Maybe today God would show you that OBC is a place where you and your family can connect deeply with God and with other believers. Who do you need to be listening to? And then here's question number four. Whose advice are you ignoring just because you don't like the person or the advice that they're giving? That's a tough one, isn't it? Who are you avoiding? Because even though they're giving you the truth you need, you're dismissing them just because you don't like them or you don't like what they're saying. I want you to take a moment right now and I want you to, to really honestly try to answer these questions as best you can.
It's tough, isn't it? It's tough, but remember, what we connect to and who we surround ourselves with shape how we live our lives. Here's the amazing part. Your heavenly Father has given you his word and his perspective on life because he loves you. And even though the idea of hearing from God can seem a bit strange, God will speak to you through the right people if you will seek them out. So my prayer for you and for me is that we won't avoid the people we need to hear from the most and that we won't ignore the information and the answers that could radically redirect our lives. Let's pray. And let's respond to God. Father, it's, it's so simple. Who we connect to, who we surround ourselves with shapes how we live our lives. God, as Christians, we're called to live our lives in ways that bring glory to you. But we don't always like to hear what the godly people around us want to say. We don't always want to hear the truth. So this is hard for us. I pray for those who are sitting here this morning and they're struggling through something and they're tempted in this direction. I pray for them. I pray that before they walk out of this room today, they would make a decision to lean into you and to lean into the voice of truth in their life, whoever that may be. I pray that we might be a church, we might be a city on a hill, that we might be a light to our community of truth and wisdom that comes from you. God help us. In Jesus' name we pray.